Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker popped wheat and Quaker popped rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King, on you huskies. Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Get it! Here's a bell ringer breakfast dish. A heaping bowl full of Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice covered with milk or rich yellow cream and topped with luscious strawberries or sliced bananas. Mmm, mmm. Just taste the tender crispness, the delicious nut-like flavor of Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. For this bell ringer breakfast treat, Hurry and get delicious Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat. The first show at the music hall was over at 10.30. Sue Marion had an hour before the next performance and decided to take a walk along the riverfront. There was a great deal of activity around the wharf where the Yukon Bell was tied up. The steamer was due to sail for St. Michael at midnight. And there was a constant stream of passengers and crew members up the gangplank. Sue watched them idly until she saw a man step out of the steamship company's office at the end of the wharf. As he stood for a second in the lighted doorway, she recognized him. Tim Blake. Tim! At the sound of his name, the man started to run down Front Street. Sue took after him. Stop! Stop, Tim! She caught up with him in the shadow of one of the warehouses and grabbed hold of his leather jacket. Oh, I finally found you. Let go of me. Where's my $500? What $500? You know very well. The $500 you still owe on the claim you bought from Dad. I don't owe you anything. The claim was no good. It certainly was. Dad made a good living out of it. And you're going to pay me what you owe me. All right, all right. I'll do it as soon as I get the money. Let me go. Wait a minute. What were you doing in the steamship office? That's my business. You were leaving on the Yukon Bell. Well, what if I am? There's no law against it, is there? I think maybe there is. You're not going to leave the territory without paying what you owe me. I'll get the Northwest Mounted to stop you. Don't you dare go near headquarters. Why not? Why shouldn't I? If you have enough money for passage to the States, you've got enough to pay me. You'll keep away from the police. Well, pay me then. I can't, and I won't. I've got to get out of the territory. Don't you try to stop me, or it'll be the sorriest day of your life. Oh, so now you're trying to threaten me. Well, I'm not afraid of you, Tim. You better be. We don't want your sweetheart Johnny Locke in the hang. You'd better leave me alone. What's that? He's killed a man. That's what he's done. You're crazy. I, I saw Johnny this afternoon just before he left town. Yes, I... but he didn't leave, see? If you try to make any trouble for me, I'll put a noose around his neck. Now let me go. Tim pulled away and ran down the street. The girl watched him go. It's nothing but a stupid lie. He's just trying to scare me. He wants me to waste my time looking for Johnny so he can get away. Well, I won't do it. Oh, Johnny isn't in town. I'm, I'm going straight to headquarters. No. No, first I'll get the papers that prove Tim owes me the money. Sue stopped at her cabin, then ran all the way to the Northwest Mounted Headquarters. She found Sergeant Preston and Constable Downey on duty. The great dog, King, was lying beside his master's desk. Good evening, Sergeant. Oh, hello, Sue. What can I do for you? I want to find out about my rights, Sergeant. Rights? Well, Tim Blake owes me $500, and he's trying to skip town without paying me. He's sailing on the Yukon Bell tonight. Isn't there some way you can stop him? You have proof of this debt? Yes, sir, right here. Sue told her story. Then the sergeant walked down to the waterfront with her. They found the purser of the Yukon Bell and... Well, no, Sergeant, I didn't exactly sell Tim a ticket. I didn't have any to sell. 
but he got one all right. Oh, how was that? From George Foster. Offered him an extra hundred dollars for his stateroom. Then that proves he has money. A mean old skin flint. And trying to scare me, too. Scare you? Well, he... He said he'd make trouble for Johnny Larkin and me if I went to the police. He threatened you. Well, I guess you'd call it that. Then Tim's broken the law, and if you want to press charges... All I want is my you'll money. you press charges to keep him here. Of course. That makes everything very simple. Has he gone on board, Mike? Not yet. He left here to get his baggage. Know where he's been living? The palace. I'll try to catch him there. Mr. Sergeant, I have to get back to the music hall. I've got another show coming. All right, go right ahead. But first, I... Well, I, I guess I ought to tell you... About the threat, I mean. Tim said he... Well, of course, it's perfectly ridiculous. It's just a stupid lie. But he said that if I went to the police, Johnny had... That he'd... What? Oh, no, he, it's so stupid. There's no sense in even mentioning it. Well, tell me, Sue. If I have to arrest him for threatening you, I must be sure of my facts. Well, well, he said he'd put a noose around Johnny's neck for murder. Murder? Johnny Larkin? As if Johnny would kill a man... As if he ever had or ever could. It's so silly. There's nothing silly about the word murder. Come on, King. <laughs> Sleepy Martin, the night clerk at the palace, was drowsing behind the desk when the sergeant and King walked into the lobby. The sergeant reached over and shook him by the shoulder. Wake up, Sleepy. Uh, yeah, what's the number you wrote? Wake up, man. Sergeant Preston. Huh? Oh, yeah, so it is. Well, how are you, Sergeant? Tim Blake registered here? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that'd be room 308. Now, wait a minute. He checked out. How long ago? Uh, what time is it? Oh, 11, huh? Well, about an hour ago, I guess. Take his baggage with him? No, he said he'd be back for it. He hasn't come back yet? Well, I couldn't rightly say as of that, Sergeant. I didn't see him. You've been asleep. Well, I'll always take a little nap early in the evening. Mm -hmm. Hey, let's see. Uh, his key's gone. Of course, he could have just reached over the desk and got it, or maybe he didn't give it to me when he went out. I don't remember. You have a pass key for the rooms? Oh, sure. Let me have it. Uh, sure thing, Sergeant. Anything wrong? That's what I'm trying to find out. Here you are. Thanks. There was only one lamp lit in the third floor corridor, and as the sergeant started toward the back of the hotel, he had to look closely to make out the numbers on the doors. As they passed 306, King stopped and sniffed at the crack beneath the door. It's the next one, King. Sergeant unlocked and opened the door. The room was dark. He lit a match and stepped inside. No baggage here, King. The bird's flown. Well, we'll catch him at the steamer. Come on, boy. But on their way back down the corridor, King stopped at 306 once more. And this time he growled deep in his throat. What's the matter, King? Something you don't like in there? Tim said murder. We'll take a look. Once more, the sergeant lit a match. And even by its dim light, he could see the room was a shambles. The cot overturned, the table and chair broken, splinters of glass from the lamp on the floor. King trotted over to a dark stain near the foot of the bed. The sergeant lit another match. Blood, not even dried. But no one here. And there's the back stairs, of course. I don't like it either, boy. It took quite a fight to wreck this room. I wonder if Sleepy heard anything. And he can at least tell me whose room this is. Come on, boy. The sergeant and King ran down the stairs to the lobby. Sleepy lifted his head from his arms as he saw them. Oh, sergeant, was he there? No. Who lives in 306? Why, that'd be Ruth Jennings. Did you hear anything that sounded like a fight on the third floor tonight within the last hour? I know, sergeant. Well, this is important. Try to remember. Was Ruth Jennings in his room tonight? Now, it seems to me that... Oh, yeah. Yeah, I heard him talking to some of the boys. Said he was going to get some sleep and go over to the Monte Carlo later. Anyone ask for him later in the evening? For Ruth? Oh, yeah, Sergeant. Johnny Larkin came in here about 9 o'clock and asked for him. Johnny Larkin? I gave him Ruth's number, but he just turned on his heel and walked out. He could have come in again by the back way. You're saying that Johnny Larkin and Ruth had a fight tonight? They may have, Sleepy. So far, it's a complete mystery. But it may be a mystery that involves murder. <laughs> We'll continue our adventure in just a moment. You know, the other morning at breakfast, I was just about to pour myself a heaping bowl full of Quaker popped wheat or Quaker popped rice 
when the strangest thing happened. I can't believe it yet. There was a terrible pounding on the door. I opened the door, and in walked a giant. What do you want here? I'm looking for a rascal named Jack. Lives next to a beanstalk. Oh, Jack and the beanstalk. But you have the wrong address. B-5, O-Pum, I'm hungry. What are you eating? Well, matter of fact, I was just trying to decide whether to eat Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat. Never tasted them myself. Oh, you really go for these ready-to-serve breakfast cereals. Why? They're so big, like yourself. They're giant size because the choice sun-ripened premium grains of wheat and rice are shot from guns. What? Yes, Quaker puffed wheat and rice are shot from guns. Exploded up to eight times normal size. Why don't you try some? Well, pour out three or four packages for me. And you'll want some milk or cream and fruit? Sure, two or three quarts of each. With a giant appetite like yours, you can't beat Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat. Wait till you taste that delicious nut-like flavor and crisp, fresh goodness. Mmm, fee-fi-fo, yum! Oh, they're good and good for you. Quaker puffed wheat and rice furnish added food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. Come on, let's eat. Okay, but first let me remind the fellows and girls listening in to ask for the big red and blue packages with the smiling Quaker man on the front. That's your guarantee that you're getting the one and only delicious Quaker puff rice and Quaker puff wheat. Shot from guns. Try them for breakfast tomorrow. And say, don't forget that exciting Sergeant Preston Yukon Trail models are waiting for you on eight different new packages of Quaker puff rice and Quaker puff wheat. You don't pay a single extra penny for these 59 larger, easier-to-build models. They come only with delicious Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. Get yours right away. Now, to continue. From the Palace Hotel, Sergeant Preston went to the music hall and questioned Sue in her dressing room. Oh, why? Why didn't I forget about the money? Well, take it easy, Sue. I'm not accusing Johnny of anything. I just want to get the facts. I I told you, Sergeant. He's going to work his claim all this summer and then sell it. We're going to be married and go back to the States. His claim's number 20 on El Dorado. Yes. Now, um, is there any reason why there should be hard feelings between Johnny and Ruth Jennings? (laughs) It's all my fault. What do you mean by that? Well, Ruth likes me, too. Johnny warned him to keep away from me. And he didn't. I can take care of myself. I told Johnny to forget about Ruth. All right, I guess that's enough. (laughs) Where are you going? To the Yukon Bell. To get Tim? Yes, Sue. Let him go, Sergeant. Forget about the money. Just let him go. I can't do that, Sue. (laughs) Not now. All right, King. (laughs) It was shortly before midnight when the purser, the sergeant, and Constable Downey held a conference on the second deck of the Yukon Bell, just outside Tim Blake's stateroom. It's time for us to cast off, sergeant. Shall I ask the captain to wait? No, Tim's probably hiding out until you're underway. We won't hold you up, we'll simply go along. As soon as we find him, you can drop us off at one of the landings down river. Sure thing. You wait in this cabin, Jim. Right, sergeant. I'll go up and have a talk with the captain. At midnight, the Yukon Bell cast off and steamed out into the river. Constable Downey waited in the dark cabin. Half an hour passed, and then he heard a faint click. Someone was turning the handle of the cabin door. The door creaked open, and the constable stood up, but as he did so, his holster hit the bunk. Instantly, the door slammed shut. The constable slammed out of the cabin. The deck was still crowded with passengers. The constable saw Tim disappearing down a companionway and took after him. But when he reached the lower deck, there was no sign of Tim. He might have descended to the engine hold or crossed to the starboard side and headed for the upper decks. The constable decided to report to the sergeant. He found him with a purser on the hurricane deck. I've seen him, sergeant. Where? He came to his cabin, but he heard me inside and took off. I lost him on the lower deck. You think the captain would lend a hand, Mike? Have some of the crew help us? He'll do anything he can. Hey! Somebody up there with that lifeboat pulling that tarpaulin deck. 
It's Blake. And he's seen us. Stay where you are, Blake, in the name of the law. The crazy fool's going overboard. He's going to jump. The sergeant pulled off his boots and his tunic. King went after him, and they hit the water shortly after Blake did. Blake, burdened down with clothes, was finding it hard to keep afloat when the sergeant reached his side. The sergeant slipped an arm around him and struck out for shore, swimming as strongly as he could. The great danger was the paddle wheel, and he could feel its suction drawing him in. He fought as hard as he could. He was powerless against the drag. The paddles were slapping the water only a few feet away. The sergeant and his helpless burden were being drawn down and under. The water closed over them. And then, miraculously, the terrible pull was gone, and the sergeant rose to the surface. So close to one of the paddles that he could touch it, but the wheel had stopped. A moment later, the sergeant, King, and the unconscious Blake were being pulled up and onto the lower deck of the steamer. As artificial respiration was applied to Blake, the captain decided to return to Dawson, and the steamer made a great circle headed upstream. Dawson was in sight when Blake opened his eyes. Uh, had a narrow uh, escape, Blake. Sergeant Preston. Yes, what made you think you could swim to shore with this money belt full of nuggets around your waist? I, I don't know what you're talking about. Now look and see, this money belt. You were wearing it. Oh, yeah. yeah there's nothing wrong in that, is there? Nothing, except the name on it isn't yours. It's Ruth Jennings. He, he gave it to me, Sergeant. I swear. It looks bad, Tim. All right. I'll admit I stole it. But I didn't kill Ruth. I swear I didn't. You'd better tell me the truth and nothing but the truth. I will. I will, Sergeant. I, I was in my room right next door to Ruth's. I heard Johnny Larkin come in, and he and Ruth had an argument. And they started to fight. It sounded like the whole building was coming down. Then finally I heard the door open and shut, and everything went quiet. I waited a minute or two, and then I, I went into Ruth's room. He was lying in a pool of blood. He was dead. I didn't even touch him, I swear. But his money belt was lying on the floor beside him, and I took it. Scavenger. It wasn't any good to him. All right. What happened afterward? I went down to the Yukon Bell and bought a ticket. That's when Sue met you. Yeah. I went back to the hotel and packed my bags. I hired an Indian to put them aboard in my stateroom. I came aboard myself when the gangplank was real crowded, and then I hid Not until Not so the... fast. When you went back to the hotel to pack your bags, did you see anyone? No. I used the back stairs. Did you go into Ruth's room again? No. When I got there looking for you, Ruth had disappeared. I never even touched him, I swear. If you didn't touch him, you can't swear to the fact that he's dead. He is, though, and Johnny killed him. What do you think, Sergeant? I don't know, Jim. You can't prove a murder without a corpse. Dead men don't usually get up and walk away. Oh, we're docking. You take Tim to jail and lock him up. Charge, robbery unarmed. I'll change my clothes and write to Johnny's claim on the El Dorado. Sergeant Preston made a quick change and was preparing to mount Blackie outside the stables and back of headquarters when King began to bark. The sergeant turned and saw Sue running toward him. The girl was holding a handkerchief to her cheek. Sergeant, Sergeant Preston. Sue, you've been hurt. No, I'm all right. What's the matter with your cheek? That's where he hit me. Who? Ruth Jennings. When? Where? At my cabin. It must have been, oh, I don't know, about a half an hour ago. What happened? Well, after I talked to you, after I finally stopped crying, I went home. Ruth was waiting for me there. He's alive. I'm glad to hear it. And I was glad to see him, even though I detest him. It was only when he began to talk that I became frightened. You see, Johnny and he had a fight. Yes, I know. And Johnny knocked him out. Ruth said that while he was unconscious, Johnny stole his money belt. But that can't be true, Sergeant. Why would Johnny... It isn't true. It was Tim who stole the money belt. Oh, and you've gotten it back. I heard them talking out in front. Tim's been arrested. Yes, what about Ruth? Well, he wanted to know where Johnny was. I could see he was in an ugly mood, and he had a gun. I wasn't going to tell him anything, but he began to twist my arm, and I had to. You told him what? Well, only where Johnny's claim is. He could have found that out some other place anyway. How long ago? Oh, about a half an hour. As he was leaving, he took the butt of his gun and knocked me down. I must have hit half my head. Half an hour. In. He's gone after Johnny, Sergeant. I know he means to kill him. Ready, Blackie? Get that cut taken care of, Sue. You've got to hurry, Sergeant. Come along, King, but I don't think you'll be able to keep up, boy. Stop him, Sergeant. I'll do my best. Come on, Blackie! The sergeant raced out of town with King close behind him. But when the contact trail was reached and Blackie was given his head, the dog was unable to keep up. It was 15 miles to Johnny Larkin's claim, and the sergeant rode hard all the way. There was a tinge of light in the eastern sky when he reached the cabin. There was a light in the window. The sergeant pulled Blackie to a sliding stop and hit the ground running. Pull, Blackie, pull. 
Johnny was lying on the floor. He was alone. The sergeant knelt beside him. Shot, but still alive. He ran outside, found the first aid kit in his saddlebag, and returned to the side of the wounded man. He slipped out of his harness and tunic and went to work. It was an ugly wound, and speed was important. He managed to stop the flow of blood and was washing the wound when he heard footsteps behind him. He glanced up only for a second. Ruth Jennings was standing in the doorway. You're wasting your time, aren't you? He isn't dead yet. He'll die, though. Not if I can help it. I heard you coming, and I hid in the woods. I was going to light out, but then I got thinking it over. The girl told you I came up here. Yes. I figured she must have. And I figured that after you found him here, you'd come after me. You're pretty good at figuring things out, aren't you? Yeah. I don't agree. I suppose you still think Johnny stole your money belt. He did. It was Tim Blake who did that. Tim Blake? You're loco. Tim Blake, who had the room next to you at the palace. Came in, found you lying unconscious on the floor with your belt beside you. He stole it. Right now, Tim's in jail and your belt's at headquarters, waiting for you. <laughs> no thanks, Sergeant. I won't be showing up at headquarters to pick it up. I got more gold stashed away. I can do without it. You think Johnny here will die? Yeah. And that you'll have to stand trial for murder. Even if he lives, it'll be attempted murder. That's correct. So you're going to try to escape? Not before I stop you from following me. Stand up and walk over to the other side of the table. I'm going to finish bandaging Johnny. Get away from your gun. I couldn't possibly reach my gun before you shoot. No, I guess you can't. I might just as well pull the trigger and get it over. Pull that trigger and hang for murder. With you out of the way, I won't hang at all. King's heart was nearly bursting. He had been left far behind on the level stretch of trail along the Klondike. But when the trail began to twist and turn around the gravel piles and sluices on the Bonanza, he had found a hundred shortcuts. And now he had found Blackie, and he knew that his master was just inside the cabin. But there was a man standing in the doorway. King saw the gun in his hand. Right, he saw him level it at the sergeant, and with desperate fury, King leaped. Oh! Ruth pulled the trigger as he went down, but the bullet splintered the table to the right of the sergeant's head. Before Ruth could fight clear of King, the sergeant's foot came down on his gun hand. The gun was twisted from his nerveless fingers. That's all, Ruth. You're under arrest in the name of the Crown for attempted murder. It was three days later that Johnny Larkin opened his eyes for the first time. Sue was sitting beside his cot, holding his hand. There was a dog at her left, and on the other side, above her head, Johnny could see a blur of red. Johnny. Hello, Sue. Is that Sergeant Preston? Yes, Johnny. And King. <laughs> what happened? Don't you remember? Ruth shot you. Oh, yeah. He said I had his money belt. The doctor says you mustn't talk, darling. Everything's all right, Johnny. Roof has his money belt. But even if he uses all the gold in it to defend himself, he'll be convicted for attempted murder. Attempted? Yes, only attempted. You're going to get well. And when you do, this case will be closed. <laughs> In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Friday's adventure, Angel of Death. Take a vote at your house, and I bet you'll find the whole family goes for delicious Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. Mom likes them because they're quick, ready to serve with milk or cream and sweet, juicy red strawberries, sliced bananas or other fruit. The youngsters go for wheat and rice shot from guns because they're exploded up to eight times normal size. They're extra crisp and tender, full of delicious nut-like flavor. And Dad reaches for the big red and blue package of Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat with the picture of the smiling Quaker man because it's such a refreshing breakfast day. And so nourishing. It gives the whole family extra food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. It's a deluxe breakfast for the family. So economical, too. Remember, the original crisp, fresh Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice comes only in the large red and blue package. A fine modern package with a sealed inner lining. That lining serves to doubly protect the flavor and crispness until the moment you pour it into a bowl. For that reason, Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice is never sold in bags or bulk. Buy both delicious kinds tomorrow. Now, fellas and girls, here is Sergeant Preston. 
I'm sure I don't have to tell you that forest fires are a terrible thing. But do you know what causes most forest fires? It isn't lightning and other natural causes. Nine out of ten forest fires are man-caused. They're due to carelessness. So if you're in the woods this summer on a hike, picnic, or camping trip, be careful of matches and campfires. If you have a campfire, drown it with water before you leave. And stir it up and pour water on it again. Remember, just one carelessly dropped match or one spark can start a fire. Remember, too, only you can prevent forest fires. And now I must see the inspector. You sent for me, Inspector? Uh, yes, Sergeant. Uriah Flint, the mine broker, sold a worthless claim to a man named Chet Logan. Now Logan has threatened to kill him. I know Logan, sir. He's too hot-tempered for his own good. He's in a dangerous mood, and I want you to find him, Sergeant, before he carries out his threat. It's your job to prevent a murder. I'll get on the case right away, sir. Come along, King. <coughs> a crooked mine broker like Uriah Flint makes lots of enemies, and here's a perfect chance for any one of them to go gunning for him. If Flint is found murdered, the crime is sure to be blamed on Chet Logan. What's more, the murderer won't hesitate to kill a Mountie if Sergeant Preston should get on his trail. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure Friday. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Enterprises, directed by Fred Flowerday, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by... Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Pop Wheat and Quaker Pop Rice. The breakfast cereal shot from guns. Remember, for delicious hot breakfast, enjoy Quaker Oats. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Delicious, nutritious, makes you feel ambitious. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. And here's why Quaker Oats is called the giant of the cereals. There's more growth, more endurance in oatmeal than any other whole grain cereal. So make your hot breakfast nourishing Quaker Oats. Quaker and Mother's Oats are the same. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Pop Wheat and Quaker Pop Rice.